did not notice that I was the only female writer at that practice. But as soon as that turned Hey, what's up, Raphael? Hey, man, how's it going? Doing okay. I was on another class and uh, got came to this one uh, to to make sure everything was ready. So, yeah, hopefully, I don't screw it up too bad. Oh no, you're gonna be fine. If I know you, you're gonna do great. It'll be okay. I, you know, I'm I've got that ADHD playing it by the cuff sort of thing where I'll just I'll just rock <laughs> it out. You're, you're just. Just go, and whenever you stop, you stop. I've got a nice Chardonnay to help me out, so. There so. you go. Uh, I, I think I'm a, I'm a bigger fan of a, of a, of a Sauvignon Blanc myself yeah. when it comes to whites, yeah. <laughs> so you excited about school starting, man? Oh, uh, yeah. Jeez, Louise. I've been on the phone all week with parents getting them all locked in and getting all their stuff. Um, 29 uh, students that's how big my class is is that a uh, is that a like half like half day each schedule or is it like 
is it all online or is it what's the uh yeah it's it, right now our district's doing all all online courses mm -hmm. which is great um except for when it's not right yeah <laughs> it's difficult to to try to connect with kids and get them um focused when there's like a dog and a little brother and a tv in the background but you know have better they, than risking health have they talked uh, about like anti-cheating measures and things like that that you guys need to be doing um negative because um a lot of the well i know for me first grade it's not really about the grade oh, your, fir your first grade teacher yeah okay yeah if you were like if you were like high school then that would be probably something that'd be yeah it would be nuts uh but yeah i'm in first grade so we're not really concerned about cheating also because like there's no real tests to speak of it's just a lot of like here's your assignment let's work through it together what's um, the what's like the heart of the curriculum in first grade is it um like what, what, what's the, what are the main things you cover in first grade well i'm uh this year i'm starting as a math and science teacher in a bilingual classroom so okay. um I'm, I'm kind of working with two different objectives when it comes to the math uh the big the the core of it is building a uh, math literacy in both languages in english and spanish um when uh, it comes to the science classroom i'm focusing more on uh, familiarity with with vocabulary with a process but just in spanish right yeah um so it's, it's more about like engaging the higher level of thinking that's necessary and then actually doing any sort of uh, like measurable work or anything like that. Um, like I spent Thursday and Friday with uh, the first couple of classes, I spent just, just counting one, th one through 10 and all the ways that you can count one through 10, using little chips, using your fingers, using little diagrams. It was, it was kind of fun actually. I was like, well, are, right. you guys, are you affected by uh, Common Core? Like, do you are you do you have Common Core as part of what you, what you or is it not like really at that at your at your grade level? Yeah, it's not it's not at my level yet. That would be third and fourth grade. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but hopefully, what well, see here's the thing is that all of my initial certifications are in like reading and writing and, and history and stuff. So I'm hoping that I get like find my feet get some stuff done and then next year or the year after I can transfer over to fourth and fifth grade yeah. writing, reading stuff. That's more in my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Is your, uh, so your fiance, is she, uh, is has she started like grad school, like formal yeah. stuff or. Yeah, yeah. Katie started, um, doing some grad school stuff right now. She's, um, uh, well, they just started, so it's been a lot of like, well, here's the syllabus. Uh, the official first day of class isn't until two weeks from now, but we want to get this information out so people can get their books, they can go whatever, whatever. Um, and which is which is also proven pretty fruitful because when she went to uh, into campus to pick up some of her materials, uh, one of her old teachers saw her there and was like, hey, my kid needs a tutor. You need a job. Do you want to do to my kid? And she was like, yeah, for sure. I'll take it. <laughs> so, so things are looking pretty, pretty okay. All things considered. Nice. Yeah. Well, it's good stuff, man. I'm excited for you. Yeah. That's, I'm, 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 I'm really, uh, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really proud of you for uh, coming on your feet, like landing on your feet so quick after the whole, uh, after the theater company kind of went, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that that ship sunk pretty fast. What did uh, uh who's the other guy with uh Tim School the um who uh who also worked in a the theater company also Justin, kind of, Justin Gibbons yeah what's he uh, what's he up to what do you, has, um, he, uh, has he figured his his stuff out well um he's still short answer is yes he's he's wrapping up his school um. I think he's got like, I think this is his last semester or something. Unfortunately, a lot of the art scenes are pretty much dead for right now, but um, he's really looking at building um, his, his presence here in the theater. So he's doing a lot of like these uh, like Zoom performances or online okay. stuff. It's, it's, I mean, he's, he's doing all right. He's doing all right. Nice. He, he got pretty sick a couple of weeks ago. We were all pretty scared. We were like, oh man. But it wasn't. It was just a really bad stomach bug. <laughs> Hey Alex, I think you're uh, you're still 
you're still like connecting with the audio. Uh, he'll be there. There he goes, gone forever to the host to the annals of time. Yeah, no, he, he's good. He's uh, he's one of the guys who works with. Um, he's in my uh, my home school in um, in uh, SoCal. Oh right, right, Tattershall, right? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, he's a big. Uh, he's also a big like overall sword nerd, so. So we don't know anything about that at all. <laughs> no, 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 no. I know nothing about that. Sword nerd? Is this is this not the the dancing the court dancing <laughs> one, one class? Is that not what this is? It's like Three Musketeers, right? Right. Yeah. Is that is that not what we're doing? Yeah. Yeah. I've got a. Uh, I've been picking up a lot of like random shit. I've got a. Uh, I've got a, a couple uh, reproduction sabers that I uh, that I have being done. Like, um, so like modern reproduction sabers are, uh, they're kind of clunky typically as a result, they don't have much distal taper. And, um, there's a guy in California who works, um, who he's like a hobbyist, but he's got like, he's pretty good with his, uh, with a grinder and mm -hmm. he, he specializes in, in regrinding, um, modern reproduction blades to, to be, to be better handling and, and, um, to fit the handling of the actual antiques. Because the current, yeah, the current like main advice that people who actually are familiar with real with real historical sabers is get a get an antique because modern ones are shit, yeah. and uh, <laughs> and so even though they have better metallurgy and stuff like that, they just they're just kind of clunky and and don't and don't really mix don't really fit it very well. So um, what uh, but. This guy, like I said, he he grinds them to make them to make them fit what they're supposed to be like, mm -hmm. and um, so it's fun. I've got a uh, I've got a French Napoleonic uh, light cavalry saber, and I've got a um, British Napoleonic um, heavy cavalry sword. Because like some people like don't call a something a saber unless it's curved, unless it has a curve. Right. It's like a sword if it's uh, if it's straight. So. It's, you know, it's different, different people's definitions, but I'll roll with it. Pointy bit goes into the other guy. <laughs> At the end of the day, it's all the same. It's yeah. all the same. <laughs> <laughs> We're all trying to stab each other in the face, really. That's. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. So when, when, is your, uh, when is your wedding in Fredericksburg again? It is June 20th. June 20th. It's exciting, man. Yeah. That's, in wedding, that's in wedding season too. It is, which is terrifying. <laughs> I have one, one of my friends is getting married in July and another one in August. And I'm like, guys, oh, they plan, they, they sent out their save the dates after I, after I had announced my wedding. And I'm like, guys, come on, come on. <laughs> Throw me a bone. <laughs> Cause we're also all going to each other's wedding. So it's like, could you, oh my God, could you have waited a little while longer? But yeah, it's another friend of mine. More people. Yeah, I pumped this class all over the place. Yeah. Hi, Etain. I should probably say hi in a second. How are things in uh in Houston? Is it is it really uh really hot and humid there? Yeah, it's really, the community is starting to pick up. Uh, we had like four consecutive days of rain last week, which oh. uh, is making this week hell, truly. Um, the electricity <laughs> bill is going to be super high. <laughs> um, you know, that, that's okay. Um, otherwise, it's fine. Uh, there hasn't been really any sort of talk about any sort of major hurricane coming our way. But I suspect it's because of the current health crisis that no one's talking about it. But yeah. uh, you know, nonetheless, I'm I'm getting all the stuff necessary and ready to hunker down if I need to. I'm gonna have this class starting at probably one one oh five because there'll probably be people jumping from other things that go until one PM mm -hmm. that will come to uh that will come to this. So that's okay though. <laughs> yeah. My uh, my home Bernie here, they're doing a, a Revel event today. That's a whole bunch of Zoom classes. Oh, uh, nice. 
but I made sure to, to schedule mine after lunch. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. I didn't have to compete with anyone for attendance. Yeah. All right. I'll keep, I'll put the chat on. Uh, um, all right. Let's see. You've been keeping in touch with many people from, uh, from Citadel? Yeah, I talked to George and Ali uh, just yesterday. They're having a little bit of a rough go. But, because you know, of Ellie's health or because of other things? Yeah, that and then Khalil broke his wrist and Elliot lost a cousin, I think, two days ago to in COVID. Costa, in Costa Rica? or? Uh, yeah, in Costa Rica. Yeah. So, you know, and I mean, I get that. I One of my uncles passed away last week, too. And it's, you know, it's hard because, you know, we're all the way over here and traveling over there is just, it's just not possible. So yeah, sort of like... In the Army, know, it's even worse. We're, uh, we're scripted, yeah, so I can't, I can't... Um, any non-local leave, any non-local vacation has to be approved by the commanding general of the post. And yeah, so it's, it's pretty ridiculous. So we're, uh, it's, uh, yeah. So the chances of me like going anywhere or doing anything. So I'm, I spend most of my days just in nostalgia for, for, uh, oh, hey. Hey, Alfin. Julian? Oh. And Jack too. More people. Uh, we're we're probably going to start at uh at one zero five, just because we want to allow people who are jumping from another class that ends at one to potentially uh, get in on this and not miss anything too much. So we're gonna be we're gonna be shooting the shit for at least a couple more minutes. But if anyone hasn't has any questions ahead of time, uh, please. Um, jump in right now if they if you have anything. Yeah. Also, I like the uh, linen garb uh, tunica that you're that you're wearing, Elfin. Thank you. I think it's wonderful. Yeah, this is uh, that line right here. Being sexy as fuck. <laughs> oh yeah, that looks great. I only did my research though after I ordered it and apparently like according to like the sources there they like them large like larger like more baggier but and mine like fits me like uh, just right so if and when I play late Roman at an event I'll be uh I'll be uh form fitting yeah pretending that I'm a little bit more fashion forward <laughs> This is my attempt at a garb, uh, my turban, covering mundane clothing. I like it. It worked. They totally had me fooled. It'll be right back. Dale, you want me to check on some button choices? All right. Like I said, uh, everyone, we're going to start at 105 just to make sure that everyone has a, has a chance to jump on this. Chandler, I am ahead of your questions because I saw the questions that you, uh, that you asked. Uh, uh, um, Hob at, uh, at his class too. So, so I'm ready. At least I hope I'm ready. Yeah. Caleb, you're as likely to wear late Roman as I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, does anyone have any, uh, any questions ahead of time about, uh, about sweating them or about, uh, or about any of that stuff. Um, I actually, so one thing I should um, say, and I will say this a little bit more in a second, is that um, if you've taken Hobbes class, there's going to be a fair amount of redundancy with this. You'll have to be patient with that because uh, I learned, full disclosure, I, I got into sweating learning from Hobbes. Uh, so so uh, don't attribute my mistakes to him, but, uh, but at the same time, um, there, there probably will be a little bit of redundancy there. I'm just appreciating the fact that I actually get to be a student in a Sputnik class for literally the first time ever. 
But we got a chance to play our Sweatnam against each other uh, uh, about four or five months ago, too, which was fun. So, ab albeit in an impromptu, uh, not knowing, not knowing uh, that each other would be there, sort of way. And I don't think I even had my close tilted dagger uh, with me when I was doing it. No, don't think so. Yeah. All right. All right. It's about 105, and uh, I don't want to be shitting on everyone else's time who all did show up on time, so we'll get started. Um, so, my name's Don Julian de La Fontaine. I am a uh, white scarf fencer in Atlantia. I've been in Kaid before, uh, to begin with, the Outlands before that. And uh, so, what I'm teaching today is an introduction to Joseph Swetnam's fencing system. Um, basically, as as interpreted uh, by by myself. So uh, we'll get a couple things way off, you know, just to start off everything. Um, one, um, we will talk about uh, Swetnam being a d bag um, uh, in regard to his other published material. Uh, I'm not going to make any apologies about it, but we'll touch on it. So. So that will be uh, covered. Um, uh, second off, um, what I'm teaching is, I would describe it as a practical um, interpretation of Swetnam's system, chiefly for SCA heavy rapier. We will talk about some other things about it, but, um, but really what I want to get at is how, for people who attend this class, is a kind of simple and effective way of taking what Swetnam teaches for two of his guards and um, basically giving you a plug and play method of being able to use it right away at your um, local unofficial or your local unofficial practice if, you, if you're in one or as soon as you are able to at your local official practice. So that being said, what, the, what Joseph Swetnam's manual, we'll cover first who Joseph Swetnam was and his manual. So, Joseph Swetnam was an English fencing master um, in the early 1600s. Maybe the late 1500s were not, we don't have a whole lot of documentation about him. And by not having a whole lot, we don't have any documentation about him teaching prior to that. Um, as far as the significance of Joseph Swetnam, he's really the first English rapier um, fencing master that we have is the first English rape fencing rapier fencing system taught by an Englishman that uh, that we have we have Italian fencing masters that moved to England and taught what they what they either were teaching beforehand or what they adapted um, in Degrassi's case and I think Saviolo's case we have them um, translating their Italian manuals into English um, so I guess technically the first English language rapier manual is de Grassi, I think that's right. Um, but the first one taught by an Englishman and simultaneous to that, a system that is more or less unique and is different, is, and is different as far as the paradigms go um, is Swetnam's in 1617. So that being said, um, you know, also you could take some of what Silver teaches and like apply it to uh, rapier, uh, but it's not explicitly rapier based, even if you were to interpret it as being so. So that being said, uh, who was Swetnam? Swetnam was a English fencing master who we have evidence of him living in Bristol, I mean, in, uh, in Bristol, Plymouth and London. We have, chiefly, he was really in Bristol. Um, most of the documentation we have of him is that he, li is that he lived and operated in Bristol. Um, as far as uh, he may have died abroad, um, but he was, we know that he was one, at least according to his own self-description, that he was the fencing master to uh, Henry, the Fe Henry Frederick, the Prince of Wales. Henry Frederick, the Prince of Wales, was the heir apparent to um, James I of England, 
um, who was the next king, the next ruler of England after Elizabeth. Um, and uh, basically he was the heir apparent and he ended up, um, he ended up dying when he was 18 years old. He was basically like super hot shit. Like he was, he was great. He was awesome. He, uh, he, he was skilled in arms, eloquent, all, all the business. And then he ended up dying and uh, dying of su supposedly natural causes. It's not really controversial as far as that goes, but um, everyone was sad. And uh, according to Swettenham, he was the fencing master for Henry Fifth, the Prince of Wales. Um, one thing that uh, Hobb talks about in his class is that um, one thing that's kind of odd about Swetnam being the fencing master for him is that he wasn't a particularly well-educated guy. He talks about uh, Swetnam was a professional soldier before he was a fencing master, and he did doesn't he doesn't he basically says I don't have a whole lot of formal education. Um, that being said, we really don't have that much of a choice about other than to take him at his word, and Swetnam. Um, as I'll go to in a second, did not have any shortage of critics in his time. Um, he, at the time, there was, it was popular in England to publish uh, pamphlets. And pamphlets were really just like kind of public little, little essays, little, little booklets that um, with the popularity of the printing press, uh, everyone's like, hey, you know, I can write shit and make it public. And he published a manual, he published an essay pamphlet um, called The Arraignment of Lewd Idol, Forward, and Inconstant Women uh, before his manual. Uh, I believe that was published in 1615. And uh, it was basically him uh, trashing on women the, the whole time through. Somewhat, you know, as, as framed as an advice, as advice to, you know, um, to young and virtuous men and kind of as a caution against, you know, being, being, uh, being involved with shitty women, but overall it came across really badly. And, um, and one of the, in the, in the general, uh, zitgeist, um, Swetnam is known for the response to that manual, that essay, I should say. And, uh, there were lots of, lots of published material against it and, uh, and women, um, basically saying, hey, you're full of shit, and these, and response, response published material to it. So, Swetnam, even for his time, was known as particularly misogynistic. The core of this class is not about him being a D-bag or a misogynist. Those things are probably true, at least as far as what we have. Um, we do have evidence of him being, a, of him having a daughter. Who knows what it was like to be his daughter? But we make, as far as, as far as me and as far as Hob, anyone that I know who teaches Swetnam, as far as rapier, doesn't make any apology to, for, uh, for him being kind of a D-bag. In his time, we're just looking at the rapier, at his rapier manual. That being said, so like I said, he uh, published his manual in 1617. He was a fencing master to, Henry, to the heir of the English throne until he died at the age of 18. And then we know basically he went back to uh, he went back to um, Bristol, taught his uh, taught fencing, and 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 published his manual in 1617. Had an intention to publish a second manual, but died in 1621 or 1622, depending on the documentation that you have. Probably abroad. So, that all being said, um, let's talk about his actual fencing manual. So, his fencing manual is the school and noble and worthy science of defense. This is my interpret my uh, actual transcription of it that I have. As far as the book itself, um, it talks, it starts off arguably like the first half of the book is lifestyle advice. And then it goes into him teaching different weapons. As far as the lifestyle advice part, really, I would even consider Joseph Swetnam's fencing manual as really just a lifestyle advice manual that then goes into techniques of fighting um, in the second half. Uh, it starts off with him 
really talking about um, one, how shitty of a life it is to be a fencing master. Um, he talks about how basically all of his um, all of his fencing master friends, or at least a huge part of them, uh, ended up dying in or having like tragic lives. He talks about how like one ended up like having his daughter get pregnant uh, out of wedlock and then he ended up going to the woods and hanging himself. Um, another one who like got his eye poked out and he couldn't teach anymore. And really just, it's, it's, just, it's just a tale of tragedy of, what, of how bad it is to live by the sword. Um, so really that kind of starts off the tone of how he, the general tone of the whole manual, which is, hey, I want overall, Joseph Swetnam wants you to live a, live a virtuous life as a God-fearing, um, upstanding uh, man of the community who, who doesn't get in unnecessary fights and generally has a life outside of fighting. He wants you to, be, to live a good Christian, God-fearing life as an upstanding member of society. And after he lays all that out, and gives gives advice about just being a kind of a good dude of that time then he starts into talking about hey if you have to get in a duel this is how you do it and a little bit even beyond getting in a duel um he talks about all sorts of weapons he talks about the uh so he talks about the back sword the either the broadsword or the short sword, which one could interpret in varying terms as being just, you know, what we call a side sword. Um, he talks about the, uh, those com uh, combined with the dagger. He talks about the quarterstaff. He talks about a wide variety of weapons. That being said, he specifically says that the rapier and dagger combined and the quarterstaff are his favorite weapons. He basically says that if you have either or both of those of those uh, combinations of weapons, then you really, you're basically good. Um, he holds those as kind of his, his highest esteem weapons, and he defines them as far as what they're supposed to be, as far as dimensions, description, that sort of stuff. And, uh, and he also devotes the majority of his instruction to those weapons. So uh, the quarterstaff system, we're not really gonna talk about it. Um, it's, he describes the quarterstaff as, be, as his quarterstaff as being eight feet or more in length. Uh, I think actually about eight feet specifically is what, is what he describes. It's compared to other quarterstaff systems, it's a pretty thrust centric system. And he even holds it in, unlike silver, he holds the quarterstaff in higher regard than like the bill and, and, and that sort of stuff, which he isn't alone in, by the way. Um, a, lot of, a lot of English um, documentation of the time talks about how awesome the quarterstaff was and, and how it's you know, basically better than other weapons. So he's not really alone in saying that, but so he has the, uh, the quarterstaff as being an awesome weapon. And then he talks about the rapier and dagger as being an awesome weapon. Um, he talks a little bit about the other ones. He talks about the single rapier. Uh, if you want to learn about single rapier of Swetnam, then you should definitely look at Stephen Hand's stuff. Uh, Stephen Hand is, the, uh, is one of the two head instructors for the Staccata School of Defense in, um, in respectively Tasmania and, uh, and um, the more populated eastern portion of uh, Australia. Uh, Stephen Han teaches in, um, in Tasmania and he has a lot of stuff on YouTube about, um, about his interpretation of Swetnam's single sword. And he also talks about in his relatively recently published book, um, Swordplay in the Age of Shakespeare, um, his interpretation of Swetnam's single rapier. However, the way he describes and the way that Stephen Hand interprets um, the single rapier of Joseph Swetnam is very different than how 
at least Hob and I interpret the um, his his rapier and dagger system. All right, so let's get into a little bit more of well. First, any questions from anybody? Nope. All right, so let's talk about a little bit more of the nitty gritty of what makes. Oh, uh, Seamus, do you have a question? I, I was just curious. What was the name of the of, of the um, uh, of the prince Swetnam was um, oh, so, was master? So Henry Frederick, uh, Prince of Wales. I'm putting the wiki entry in the chat right now. Great, thank you. Yeah. So anyway, uh, let's talk about a little bit of what makes Joseph Swetnam's fencing uh rapier and dagger system which i'm teaching i'm not teaching the other things as far as this and i'm only teaching two guards of it by the way so as far as what makes his system a little bit different as far as the our general understanding of rapier and dagger what makes it different um one he talks about uh on most fencing masters don't talk about wounding your opponent I remember doing a comparison where I looked at the um, about the I looked at the um, the different wound locations, the different attack locations of um, Giganti and and uh, and Capofero and Fabris, and almost all of them. So first off, Giganti and Fabris head most of the time, almost the vast majority of the time. Fabris body most of the time. Um, Swetnam is in a very rare crowd of explicitly saying to target non-lethal parts of the body. Uh, and that goes very much in line with his tone of it being a lifestyle manual. Um, a big, also part of his first half of his book is him giving um, advice about dueling. So one, he says, don't fight people who are drunk. You know, that's stupid. Um, he talks about you know not drinking too much on top of that. He talks about uh, how you should be um, dueling in the morning if you do have to duel instead of uh, instead of you know at the end of the day because people tend to get drunk. They've got the liquor in them at, toward the end of the day. Um, generally, he doesn't want you to fight um, and and at the risk of being redundant with uh, with Hobbes class. Um, he. One, he doesn't want you to get in unnecessary duels. Two, he doesn't want you to fight drunk people or be drunk when you're doing it. Um, he, he definitely is not a fan of the demon liquor. Uh, so, he, so he gives a lot of practical advice about how to, you know, if you have to fight a duel, which you shouldn't, um, this is, these are some practical considerations. Um, he talks about how, you know, you should be, Fencing with the uh, with the sun to your back instead of the sun at your front. We all know that from uh, from SCA rapier. Um, he talks about how one of my favorite pieces of advice, by the way, is that he says that if you if uh, you get your if you drop your rapier or if you get disarmed of your rapier, you should get your dagger and uh, grip it by the blade and pretend to pull it back as if to throw it at your opponent, and then as they flinch then you should you know, use that opportunity to go down and grab and grab your rapier use that use that you know pause in the fight to go down and grab your rapier so if anything Swetnam's manual is fun to read for its just its stories and practical advice but going back to the actual what he talks about his system as far as what he talks about he says that you should be targeting um, non-lethal parts of the body if you can. So um, like he talks about targeting the closest part of, of their body. So um, their, their forearm, he talks about plucking your point onto their thigh, onto their arm, onto their shoulder. Um, he definitely, and he, he explicitly mentions how you should be doing that so you don't get sued after, you're, uh, after, you, after you get in a duel with them. You know, because if you kill them, at least according to the English common law at the time, you can get sued or you can get in a feud or all sorts of messy business. Um, more on that if you want to read the manual more. But it's 
It's hilarious, alternatingly hilarious and horrifying. Uh, so the first piece of general advice that he gives is to target non-lethal parts of the body. You know, the closest, at least the closest ones. He specifically says the closest parts, which as far as his system goes and as far as most rapier systems go are like the arms and the legs and that sort of business. Um, another part of sweating system that is also pretty, um, that is, he's in not, not necessarily the majority of fencing masters I'm talking about is that it's almost explicitly linear. He does not advocate lateral, unnecessary lateral movements. And there's a few ways to interpret that. One is the sense of simplicity of it. If you don't need to do it, don't do it. And that's true across uh, fencing systems. Um, that being said, uh, generally, if you're looking for a tactical advantage um, to be gained by moving laterally, it's based on constraint in the Italian system where I don't have, if I want to like get over my opponent's sword and I don't want to like have to touch his blade in order to do it, I can move laterally to change our body relationship so that my blade is on top of his blade without, um, without actually touching it. Constraint is not a huge part of Swetnam system in the first place. Um, although we'll talk about that a little bit more in the in my interpretation of the forehand ward. But all that being said, Swetnam is really a linear system if you're doing it in an orthodox way. Um, all right, so we can talk a little bit more about the general characteristics of the system as they apply to um, the, specifically to the techniques and the guards. But we'll start off with the, with his true guard. And the majority of what he teaches in the rapier and dagger system that he teaches is from the true guard. And actually real quick, we'll talk about what his ideal rapier and about what his ideal rapier is and what his ideal dagger is. So I'm gonna grab both of mine right here. All right, so as far as his, uh, he is, along with a couple other fencing masters, is pretty explicit in saying what the ideal weapons for his system are. So when he's talking about his dagger, he says that it should be close hilted and at least two feet in length. So what I have here is a close hilted dagger that with an 18 inch blade, which is the maximum length, what is defined as a dagger blade in the SCA. Um, and overall, this is almost exactly two feet long. So this whole business right here is about six inches. So this fits that, fits that description. Um, you can't, he does say that it should be longer rather than shorter as far as, as far as the overall length. There are people who do, you know, you can use a dagger that is longer than, than this in the SCA, but remember it won't be classified as a dagger. What you'll be doing is technically case because if you're using a 20 inch, a 20 inch blade in the SCA is technically a sword blade, not a dagger blade, but Okay. Whatever you do in case, you know, you're doing sweat and dagger as case, it works. The other part is he says that the um, that the rapier should be uh, four feet at least in length. What that translates to, as far as the blade goes, is that a typical 42 inch blade with a typical rapier hilt is, is around 48 inches and um of relevance to my last class that this question was brought up. Uh, feet in the time of, um, in the early Stuart period, uh, were more or less the same as they are now. Um, there really isn't that much of a conversion difference. Um, but that being said, you, as far as like the general rapier considerations in uh, right now, yeah. You should probably be using, at least if you're doing the ideally to the system, you're talking about a 42 inch or more blade. Um, 48, everyone has opinions about whether that's practical or not. Um, 
that being said, both of these prescriptions for what is the ideal um, weapon for a system comes into practical considerations. Um, in my opinion, it's more important to have a close hilted dagger, a dagger that protects as much of your hand as possible, than it is to have lots of protection for the, for the hilt of the rapier. And that's because most of Swetland's guards have your dagger held forward prominently, which means, and on top of that, he's advocating you should be targeting their hand or their arm if it's, if it's out there. So um, when I'm holding this out, and this is my primary defensive tool, having, having you know, a big mamma jamma guard right there helps. This is, this is a good thing. And we'll talk a little bit about how to tweak this. Um, how, the big mamma jamma guard. So what, what are you saying, uh, Edmund? Oh. I'm gonna put you on mute, Edmund, unless oh, you- uh, Sorry, I thought I wasn't muted. Told you. What? All right, you're mute. Anyway. Uh, so having that, having that guard, we'll talk a little bit about how to tweak, um, how you're orienting your, uh, your, your wrist and forearm, um, to take advantage of that. Because when you're still holding it out, even though you've got sail hawk, a sail, a sail guard dagger or a pretty big guard dagger, opponents are still going to try to pick at that. And you want to be adjusting your system to, um, defend about, defend against that as much as possible. Um, as far as the rapier itself goes, having a longer rapier means that you can make more conservative poking attacks um, at a longer measure, um, which is very much in keeping with Swetnam's system. He, if you have to have a shorter rapier, that means you have to commit your body more um, and you have to get closer into your opponent, which is really kind of against Swetnam's general advice. All right, any questions on the... Um, Actually, you know what, Chandler, I'm going to mention real quick what you, uh, so I, met, I noticed that you had uh, asked Hob during his class about what you do if you have to use a smaller, a, um, a simple hilted or, uh, or ring hilted dagger um, when you're doing sweat and system. And I've done this. Um, sometimes when I'm doing Italian and whatever I'm doing in Italian just doesn't work against my opponent, um, I'll just switch to to playing from, uh, from Swetnam's True Guard using a ring-hilted dagger or uh, Swetnam's Forehand Guard using a ring-hilted dagger, and I'll adapt it to make it work. But there are considerations to make it happen. Um, I'll start off by uh, going to a similar guard to Swetnam's True Guard in Fabris. So this is Fabris's Plate 60. And if you have Fabris, you can play along with me, but you'll notice that his true guard in this is that Swetnam's true guard is, that I'll show you all in a second, is pretty similar to this. But um, the main consideration of that is that you want to rely on your sword to defend a little bit more than, uh, than your dagger will be. Um, but we'll talk about that in a second. So, um, any equipment questions before we go into his stance and his uh, his true guard? Um, how you how you hold your weapons? All right, cool. So um, you're not going to be able to see my feet with the uh, with the camera as it is. So I drew a nice little picture for you guys about how um, how the feet are oriented and how his um, how oh, so the building a. But, sorry, go ahead, Sean. My follow us meter, thank your pardon. So, one more time. Okay, all right, so, anyway, this is Swetnam's True Guard. So, the key hallmarks of this are that one, you'll notice that, that the feet are closer together and are not at 90 degrees or greater than they are in a typical uh, Italian rapier system. So you'll see the feet right here. Your forward foot is corresponds with your um, with your dominant arm that holds your rapier. Your rear foot is relatively close to it, and uh, and typically is depicted. He doesn't actually say which way your rear foot's supposed to be pointing, but he hints at it 
and in the illustrations, which he admits are imperfect, uh, it's more or less at about 40, kind of a 45 degree angle. So you'll see with, if the rear foot, if the front foot is facing forward and the rear foot is, is close behind it, about so. And then when you look at the true guard, this is what it looks like. And we'll go from feet to head as far as how that works. So first off, you've got the feet relatively close together. Now, one thing, and this is where my interpretation of the system differs as far as how Swetnam uh, describes it. So Swetnam describes the rear leg as being bowed backward instead of forward. Um, that is, that can be interpreted in lots of weirdly different ways and can be, you know, attributed to maybe a, uh, a difference in, um, in uh, Stuart slash Elizabethan English language versus now. But if we're talking about it being bowed backward, the knee being bowed backward as being forward instead of being forward, if you're looking at basically locking that in place or hyper locking it in place, um, it really doesn't lend toward a good lunge. And the lunge is the basis of Swetnam's system. So in the absence of Swetnam, uh, being here to clarify that, I don't recommend that you, uh, that you lock your leg or try, to, or try to bend it backward. Don't advise that. Um, instead, what I, what I, and from what the practical, um, for most people who do Swetnam system practically advise, is to keep it slightly bent um, and basically keep both legs slightly bent uh, relatively closely together. So we're going further up and you get to your hips. Your hips is where things really start to come together as far as how Swetnam uh, advises the system. The first part is that he says hollow your body. Now um, as far as hollowing your body goes, the practical reason for this is that he wants your legs to be further back than, than, uh, than the part of your body that is defended, that is defended by steel. So you've got your, you've got your, your bending forward at the, at the, at the hips. Now, different people have different interpretations of how they bend, how they bend forward or how far they bend forward. And I'm going to, real quick, um, refer back to what Swetnam says in the text about that. Because some people have a more upright stance and his, um, in the illustration, which once again, Swetnam says is bad, um, is a more upright stance. But we'll go to, uh, to what he says about the, um, about the, the true guard here. One second. All right, so he says, Let's see. Furthermore, in standing in thy guard, thou must keep thy thighs close together and the knee of thy foreleg bowing backward. Once again, in the absence of sweat and clarifying that, I don't recommend bowing the knee backward. Um, rather than forward, but thy body bending forward, for the more thou hollowest thy body, the better, and with less danger shalt thou break thine enemy's thrust. So you can't stand upright. Cool. Um, that being said, as far as the text goes and as far as my, my practical, uh, my, my experience in trying to use true guard, um, you can do something as forward, like as forward uh, hip hinged as much as fibrous, as much as you see in some of the more exaggerated fibrous cards, I should say, like the one that I showed you earlier. Um, and at least as far as the wording of the text goes, it seems to be that he doesn't necessarily disagree with that. But that's kind of, that's one of the parts that's flexible. So anyway, we've got our body hollowed and we're, and we're basically leaning, leaning forward at the hips. Next he says to hold your rapier at your girdle stead. So basically at like the, where your pockets would be, um, Really, where you hold your rapier is very much dependent on how far your point extends with your dagger. And we'll get into that. So you're leaning forward, you've got your head. Um, you've got your head, I would not 
try to hold your head too far upright because your dagger is in to a certain degree protecting that next you've got your dagger arm extended and he goes over this many times where he says that you should be extending your dagger basically as you should keep your dagger extended even as your defenses you should not be bringing your dagger back so you've got your dagger arm extended and you you orient your point of your dagger and we'll see right here Ugh. all right you've got your point of your dagger oriented on your enemy's face so you've got your point of your dagger enemy, oriented on your enemy's face and you join the point of your rapier within two or three inches of the point of your dagger and then you have your rapier the hilt of your rapier on or around your girdle stead that will all depend on how you're uh, on you know how long your rapier is but the most critical aspect of the, of this whole picture as far as as far as your guard is composed with your weapons oriented is that your point of your rapier and the point of your dagger are more or less in the same place and juxtaposed between your face and your opponent's face as far as the decision making tree that that kind of goes into that. Um, we can talk about how how that how the the, the kind of the finer points of that interface. Uh, but I'll demonstrate to you guys in from here how that looks with me doing it. So I've got my rapier. I've got my dagger. I am orienting it toward you. I'm leaning forward. I've got my rapier point within two or three inches of, uh, of the point of my dagger. And they're in more or less the same plane. And this comes into play as far as how the basically three part defense and offense decision making tree happens uh, from the true guard. But you'll see with the, rape, with the length of my, of my rapier right here from the side, I'm holding it about like so. If you're using a ring hilted dagger or one that doesn't protect you as much, um, Swetnam says you should be defending, um, defending. Instead of using your dagger to defend from that position, you should be using your rapier blade to defend from that position. As far as my interpretation goes of that, I don't necessarily think that that's the best advice because my counterpoint to that would be if you are defending with your sword, why do you have your dagger extended at all? Because he doesn't advocate that you should be attacking your opponent with your dagger. So I guess my, my question would be if you are using a non simple, hilt, if you are using a non close hilted dagger, in my opinion, you shouldn't be extending that in the first place. Uh, Chandler, maybe you have like kind of counterpoint. You can either say that in your uh, via, via um, voice or via text. Um, in my opinion, if you are using a ring hilted dagger, my, I would say adapt it to make it work, but you should be good with it first. You should, you just need to be that much more diligent as far as making sure that you catch your opponent's blade, uh, you catch your opponent with your blade instead of your hand, and, uh, and you are really paying attention to your distance. Hey. Um, yeah. I guess uh, as someone who's, who's done um, Swetnam and Italian kind of for a similar amount of time, the only thing I could think of why you would still keep the dagger out there is because with the way he frames his posture, in his true guard is that would be an immediate target for his opponent. Um, so from his perspective, if they're fencing like the way he likes to fence, they're gonna go for that immediate target. So you kind of know where their point is going. And from there you work with the rapier. And, th and that's then, the so right. you're in a little bit less danger cause you know they're going for a non-lethal target and then you, you know where their point's gonna go. But um, I do kind of agree with you that I, especially for what we do in the SCA. I don't think it's the best idea just to throw your hand out there if you're worried about it getting hit at all. Yeah, yeah, and people will, especially if you have a regular ring-hilted dagger, 
pointed out there, they're going to pick at that. They are definitely going to pick at that. So if you're confident enough that you can catch their temp, their tempi super early and you can catch them with your blade and then, and then turn it to your advantage and you're willing to trade your, your hand for a, for maybe their arm or, uh, or a more lethal target on their part, you know, that's, that's situational dependent. Um, at the end of the day, I definitely agree with, uh, with Hob that, um, that it's his equipment prescriptions are really ideal to his system. You can make it work if you don't, if you don't have his ideal equipment, but it is incrementally less, you have to, you have to, you have to create workarounds in order to make it happen. Um, so, uh, let's talk a little bit. I went a little bit further into the guard. Let's talk a little bit about his uh, about his footwork and uh, and his measure, real quick. So with his with his footwork, generally, Swetnam does not recommend offensive passing. Um, he want he you have that ideal stance once again, relatively close, relatively close together, uh, feet with your lead uh, with your lead leg forward, and uh, and he wants you to be doing simple advances and simple and simple retreats sometimes he advises passing retreats um he calls them slips in specific scenarios uh but generally you want to be doing simple lunges simple lunges um usually first intensive first intention offense and we'll talk about that in a second um and then, uh, and uh, let me think what else. So, yeah. And then you don't really want to get deep into the fight. He also recommends that you stay at your true, at your, um, at your best distance the whole time. He, uh, at one point he talks about how basically when you get in close, I believe this is in his end, his end advice that, uh, that getting in close is a total shit show. And you see that with, with a lot of modern rapier fencers. Really what Swetnam says is that you should be within lunging distance of your opponent's forward targets, and you should really stay at that. Um, he's definitely a very simple, staying in a lunging distance of your opponent's forward targets and do single intention attacks and defenses but i'm going down rabbit hole so we're getting a little bit further in the class so uh let's talk about the three zones of defense for um for rapier and dagger with how he how he composes it so we'll go back right here so if i'm in my in my true guard i have basically three three areas that my opponent can attack me in. I have this area right here below my dagger and to my right, my left, your right of my sword. He advises that you defend with the dagger and you attack with the sword, and this is common across basically all three of the ways, uh, to defend with it and attack, to defend with your dagger, sweep low, and attack with the sword in the same quadrant for basically all three guards. But if we're talking about this quadrant right here, we sweep low, extend in the same, in the same zone as where my dagger is, I keep them joined, and then lunge, take a short lunge if you need to at all, in counter to your opponent's attack. The same thing applies if they were going over the dagger blade, almost the exact same concept. So I sweep up this time, catch my opponent's blade, and lunge. Once again, I'm using the dagger for the defense of all of this. And as far as how I'm orienting my guard of my dagger, I definitely recommend the orient it be the actual protective party of your guard downward, like so. Because if I hold it like this, and especially if I'm cocking my arm, that makes my forward leading arm a very juicy target. So I've got my, dagger, my guard oriented downward, I'm either sweeping low if they go in here, extending, I'm sweeping high if they go above my dagger blade, 
next setting. And the trickiest of the three decision of these three decision making processes, those are two, is if they go to the right side of my rapier right here. In this case, and this is where not crossing my my sword, my uh, my dagger and my sword blade in the uh, in my defense really comes most into play, is that I need to be able to quick I quickly move my my dagger blade along, catch my opponent's blade, and I can either go above that with my rapier blade, which I generally prefer, or you can go below it with your rapier blade. But once again, it's a really simple three-part decision-making tree. If they go below my blade, boom. So above, rotate up. So, and I'm doing these simultaneously. And then if they go to my right, like I said, I prefer to go above or alternatively, you can go below. If your opponent throws a cut against you, which he calls a blow in his manual, he advises that you typically catch them double. And he reinforces this many times throughout the manual, including defenses against like quarter staffs and all sorts. Basically, if someone's throwing a cut against you, he recommends that you use both your both your dagger and your sword together to catch them in uh, to catch it in a sympathetic way. Which other masters do talk about as well? As far as the offense goes, that is the typical defense of a uh, of when you're attacked and you're holding in Swetnam's true guard. As far as the offense goes, he advises feints, but as a practical consideration, I find that really your your offense is how you want to do it. As long as you're doing simple, one, basically simple, single intention offenses, simple intention lunges against near targets, you typically using feints make it work. But one thing I will say is that, and maybe Hob and I differ a little bit in our interpretation of this, is I don't necessarily advise that you move your dagger sympathetically with your rapier as you're doing your offenses. So if I'm if I'm in my true guard and I'm and I get into a good distance with my opponent, I I might just pick at them. Maybe do like whoop, over here, but I won't necessarily be moving my dagger um, sympathetically with that sword because really holding that dagger right here, this is just a great offense, a great defensive position in general. It keeps my opponent warded off of me. And um, it threatens them and basically keeps them at a distance. Um, Hob, maybe you have. I think we agree on that. Yeah. 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 I mean, you want the dagger to stay there, and your sword is just sort of screwing around to, <laughs> to sort yeah. of draw them out of what they're doing. Yeah. When I'm working in True Guard, I a lot of times I'll just keep my dagger just just forward extended and just and I'll just be getting into distance and poking at them until they give me something to work with. Um, but he definitely says, don't, don't overcommit your, um, your sword, because if you get it pinned and I'm using the term pin in my, in my, um, in my vocabulary, but if you get it pinned by your opponent, then they can do all sorts of nasty stuff with you. Any questions about the true guard where I'm going a little bit late in the class, but, uh, I really want to get into the forehand ward because this is kind of where the other guard that I really like to work with for Swetman. Any questions? All right, so let's go into the forehand ward. So Swetman doesn't talk much about the forehand ward. And what he does say is very simple, but I'm gonna use it as a launching point for my, for my interpretation and how I originally kind of saw it and interpreted it uh, when I first saw it. So, the forehand ward. So he says, put that rapier hand under the hilt of thy dagger, always keeping the point of thy rapier somewhat variable, and yet something directly about the girdle stead of thy enemy. And the point of the dagger in the manner upright, or verily, a, or very little leaning toward the left side, and both da thy dagger and rapier hilts together, and both so low as thy girdle stead, 
those being guarded, if thy enemy does do charge thee with a thrust, carry thy dagger quick over toward the right side and make a and make a present answer by chopping out. And by the way, when he says chopping out, he means thrust. That is like a super easy way to get like really confused in, in Sweatman's manual is to think that a chop means a a cut. It doesn't. Um, at least as far as all the stuff that I've that I've seen. Like when he says chop, he means like kind of I guess an aggressive thrust forward. Um chopping out the point of thy rapier and so hastily into thy guard again, expecting a fresh charge. So that is a one part decision making tree that he describes. I advocate a two part decision making tree from this card. So once again, he says you have you still have that hollowed out guard, and this is important because I'm taking my feet out of the equation. I've got my dagger extended forward vertically, and it's stacked on top of my rapier guard. Now what I do from this place is I'm creating a two part decision making tree for my opponent. What I do in Italian terms is I will use the point, the blade of my rapier to constrain my opponent's blade to either side. And this creates a point, and this creates in the Italian terminology where someone has, doesn't have a direct line of attack to me. So if, I'm, if they are on, let's say this side, and I were to cover their blade with my rapier blade right here, they have to change that blade relationship in order to attack me. And because I've got my dagger right here in the center, they have to choose one side of my rapier blade. They can either try to go over right here, or they can go under, disengage, and go to this side over here. So I constrain my opponent's blade, they go to the other side, or whichever side they choose of my dagger, and then I push to that side with my dagger, not too far, and extend forward. Either it lands or it doesn't, and then I recover back into guard. Same way with the other side. Constrain, and then they, they counterattack. You push to either side, and attack in the same side as you defend. It's really just as much a, um, it's going along with the same principles of, those, of that true guard, where I am defending defending in the same zone as I am attacking with the, uh, with the rapier, but it goes from a three-part decision-making tree into a two-part decision-making tree. Um, as far as questions against that, uh, people ask, hey, you know, what if they do a two-part attack? Well, you ward them off and get the hell out of dodge and then try again. And that's just a general term, a general advice throughout the whole manual is Swetnam doesn't want you to be getting into, pro, into protracted exchanges. He wants you to be doing either one simple, like one or two intention attacks, two attention being like a feint and a follow-up and a follow-up thrust, or two, doing a simple defense and then getting, and then getting out of there. Um, he doesn't want you to get bogged in. And, because, and that is reinforced by his talking about how you want to be remaining at your ideal distance. So, um, as far as just generally looking at Swetnam as a system, I call it my low spoons or, um, or, my, uh, um, or my torchlight turning system. Because when you're working from the true guard, at least is how I interpret it, um, you've got a three-part decision-making tree with your opponent's attack. Either one, you sweep low and attack, you sweep high and attack, or you, or you do a cross parry and attack. If you're doing a forehand ward, cover them, force them to attack you to one side or the other, press on either one of those sides and attack in the same side. It's the simplest thing in the world. And if I were to take a complete newbie in rapier and I had to get them ready to fight in, in a week, I teach them that. Um, and that really goes into like I said, low spoons, you're tired, you don't want to have to be executing complex issues making trees, do that. Um, any questions before we go into maybe some additional considerations or people want to drop off? 
Uh, Jay, Eric, you went, uh, you went unmute. Do you have any questions? Nope, not quite yet. All right. So let's, uh, let's talk real quick about, uh, different considerations. We talked about, um, the, uh, defense against complex attacks. Like I said, don't get bogged down in complex attacks. Do your defense, do your, uh, do your counterattack. And then if it works or if it doesn't get out of there, um, he does say that you don't, he actually explicitly says that at one point in his manual, I don't have the, the part underlined right here, but he says, your attack, succeed or fail, recover into your, into your good guard. Um, as far as, so yeah, complex attacks, don't get bogged down to them. Don't try to play with, don't try to play your opponents into a, into a protracted exchange. It just becomes something that you can't control, and it's less. It's it goes against the conservatism of the system as a whole. Um, we talked about simple to daggers. As far as simple to daggers, in my opinion, I would using the sword to defend instead of your dagger defeats the purpose, in my opinion, of a lot of holding that dagger forward in the first place. Unless you're using that dagger as a lure, which is which can be dangerous. Instead, if you're going to, you can make it work. I have made the true guard work, and I have made the forehand guard work with a with a uh, with a ring hilted dagger. You just have to be really diligent about making sure that you catch your opponent's blade with your blade in exactly the right spot. Otherwise, you're just playing with fire. Um, as far as catching it on your hand, um, shorter swords. Um, you get to a certain point, and this is where shorter swords can also be a little bit dangerous with Sweatnam system because he wants you to pick at your opponent from a distance. He wants you to have that good distance, and he wants you to be using that distance and really only that distance only to 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 uh, to poke to poke at your opponent's forward areas. Um, generally, Sweatnam probably doesn't want you to be digging at their head or their, uh, or their, or their body. If you, uh, if you don't need to. Um, so if you're using a shorter sword, you just have to understand that you're going to be assuming more risk in, uh, in, in having to dig deeper into, uh, and commit more of your body into getting at their targets. Um, let's see. Those are the main things I can think of as what I have, what I, my interpretation of the Swetnam system really comes from one of three sources. One, um, reading from, uh, from uh, John Hobson's uh, excellent website, Swetnam.org. Um, two, reading the manual um, itself. And three, playing with it in, in person in real life. And like I said, my interpretation of forehand guard is differs a little bit probably pretty substantially from the text, but it, in my opinion, it's very much in keeping with his paradigm for the true guard and it's uh, for his, yeah, for his true guard and, um, and with his general advice across the system as a whole. It just differs as far as using that constraint as the prompting uh, decision for, for making your opponent choose which side of your deck are they going to attack you onto. All right. Any, any questions as a whole or practical considerations? Uh, so does Swetnam's system uh, more or less rely on the, your opponent closing distance um, to attack? So no, not necessarily. Um, if you're, uh, I would say that Sweatin probably leans toward um, if you're if you're looking at it as a complete system. I would say if you're not being if you're not being threatened, you're getting into your good measure with your opponents. Probably like forearms. Um, you're a lunging distance for your opponents' forearms and maybe thighs, depending on what guard they're playing at. You're poking at them and playing feints at them while remain while keeping that composed guard from that, but not committing overly to those attacks and then if they do throw an attack at you you do one of you do you do one of those combined 
um, single tempo uh, counter counterattack and defenses, and then getting back and then rinse and repeat. Um, it's it's definitely uh, um, sorry. Uh, did that did that answer that or is that a? Um, I think so. Uh, so from the sound of it, it's it's yeah, like you said, poking at distance and yeah. um, if if they come in, then you're, you're counter. So one thing that I will say is that Swetnam probably doesn't want you to be a, a sword master. That's really kind of it, not in keeping with, with, uh, with his paradigm. He wants you to probably be spending more time going to church, managing your investments, and being a good member of your community, maybe running for the city council or whatever, uh, than, 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 uh, than becoming, a, becoming a sword master. He wants you to this is his system is about not get about uh, is about if you have to get in a fight this is how you this is how you survive and this is how you don't and this is how you how you get it out get out of it okay with your body and your reputation intact um there is a little bit of question marks there because we do know that um like i said he taught the the heir the heir apparent to the english crown was he teaching the heir apparent to the English crown um, a, a uh, kind of the same system that he was teaching guys that were, that were potentially getting in duels at, uh, at the local pub? We don't necessarily know that because why would he be the fencing teacher for, the, for, the, for you know, someone who's going to be leading troops into battle if he wasn't also teaching him how to kill people? Um, so you can extrapolate stuff about what he teaches to doing lethal blows. Um, and I do, um, because I would say I still like to make lethal shots in, uh, in rapier, in SCA rapier, but it's, um, uh, what he teaches and what we teach, take at face value from his manual is basically what I described. Um, your, uh, hold a good defense, and be very conservative in how you're doing it. One thing that actually he does mention, and if anyone needs to drop off, that's fine. I, I, I won't be offended. Uh, one thing that I think is, is misinterpreted, because when he talks about how to hold a good guard, he says that you should uh, stand against the wall and your opponent should be 12 feet away from you. And once again, feet are the same basically in that time. And so 12 feet is a long lunge. There's Additional considerations that Stephen Hand in his YouTube video uh, talk about that I, I don't necessarily agree with. So one, he's talking about your opponent standing 12 feet away from you. One, you're in the time period, you're not necessarily talking about blades that are protected. Uh, that are, so you're not necessarily trying to kill your opponent at 12 feet. Um, you're just basically using them as a point of orientation. The second part about that is that when your opponent is standing 12 feet away from you, if they are also doing that extended forward guard, their hands and feet, their hands and feet might be more like nine or nine or 10 feet away from you instead. And that starts becoming a much more reasonable lunge, long lunging distance uh, from you. So um, when, when Swetnam says like your opponent should be, if you do get the manual and you see that your opponent standing 12 feet away from you, don't think that 12 feet is, necessar is necessarily you skewering their body at 12 feet. 12 feet is them giving you a point of orientation and maybe giving you hands and feet to target at 12 feet. But it 12, there, there's, I would not be, approaching the system from having super deep lunges at that long of a distance. It's about conservatism and simple decision-making trees. Any other questions? Uh, Hob, do you have any, uh, anything that um, I'd be happy to, to discuss with you? Any, any things that uh, maybe you, uh, you have questions about interpretation? No, this has been great. I, I really liked your talking about the orientation of the dagger guard, which is something I tend to forget about in my true guard. Is I, don't think it's enough about protecting against the snipe yeah like when if i hold my dagger like here like with my with my with my um the 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 main part of my guard facing like toward my like 10 or 11 o'clock like boy people love to, to go at this right here but if i'm if i'm being diligent and trying to get it right here which might pronate my wrist in a little bit of an uncomfortable way 
but it still is gives my it it really shuts down um, that that forward part of my arm uh, from my opponent. And I share your ambiguity about the forehand guard and constraining, where it's like he it sort of seems to violate some of what he's saying, but also works incredibly well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's that's for me like incorporating a constraint with them with forcing my opponent to choose one side of my dagger um really works like you said super effectively and it really uh and it also creates a sense of urgency to your opponent because not only do you have your point forward and threatening your opponent but you also have um you also have you know 42 to like typically 45 inches of rapier blade shutting out a zone of attack that they have um on whichever side you're orienting to so basically they have to choose that big old side of that, uh, of, of, of whichever your dagger. And then you just do a simple press on either side, give them a counter, give them a counter poke and then get out of there. Any other questions? I know we're going uh, to I got one on. quick one. Yeah. You don't have to go super into detail. I was just curious what your thoughts on it were. He, uh, Swetnam kind of talks about, how you grip the sword a little bit more than I think most other yes. masters do. I can totally um, talk about that. Yeah. In my experience, and, and I, I think he, he kind of says it doesn't make a huge difference. Um, it's just some are more preferable than others. Um, but I, I don't really like going with the full finger over the Ricasso, like the full Italian style, at least for his true yeah. guard. Um, I don't find that to be super comfortable, although it is doable. Um, and I just want to know what kind of your thoughts on that yeah, were. Yeah, so, so Swetnam talks about three different ways of gripping the sword. Um, so the first one he talks about is, I think he calls it like the natural way. And he talks about how you have your thumb uh, along the blade. What, how I interpret this, if any of you all do Tabo, um, it's basically Tabo's way of gripping the sword. And where you have your thumb basically forward over your... Um, <laughs> like basically forward and along your ricasso, like that. Um, that's how Thibaut's uh, main grip of the sword is. Um, it's, it's also how I feel comfortable gripping a, uh, an arming sword that's like particularly blade heavy. Um, the advantage of that is that you have that, just like how when you're gripping your dagger with your, with your, fo with your thumb forward, you have that, that, um, that, kind of sympathetic muscle memory of knowing, hey, my sword is facing this way at any point in time. So that's the first rapier grip that he talks about. The other one, which you're talking about, I think, is where he says you lock your, you lock your forefinger and your thumb together, where it's basically like this, um, where you have your, your thumb overlapping your forefinger and how you're gripping your sword. Now he says, once again, non-standardized uh, early English language, or not early, pre, like early modern English language. Um, he says pummel, and he means different things when he says pummel. He, like, when he's talking about the, uh, like, the third grip that I'm gonna talk about in a second, he says, you know, keep these part on your pummel and then have this part on your pummel. It's like, ah, oh. but anyway, pummel typically means grip and or pummel. But so when he's, so the grip that you're talking about is when you have like this. And I think what he, in keeping with the conservatism of Swetnam's system, I think he means, he wants you, he mentions that grip specifically so that you don't get disarmed. Because this is really good against your, your sword getting like beaten out of your hand. Um, and that's probably the worst case, one of the worst cases scenarios of a duel is, hey, I don't even have the ability to use my rapier because it was knocked out of my hand. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why he talks about that. Um, and then the third grip that he talks about is pummeling, is, is where he says, keep your, your, uh, your first like couple or, or a couple fingers on your grip and then have the other parts on the pummel. In this case, he's talking about the other pummel, your pommel of your sword, where it's like this. And you see some people in the SCA doing that when they want to get like a couple extra inches out of their sword. 
I think he's the only master that we know that actually explicitly mentions that grip. But getting to your, your question, Chandler, um, as far as how, like how, you know, what grip works best with his two guard, honestly, most of the time when I'm doing sweating him, I have, I have a, I have a two finger grip over my guard. Uh, sometimes one finger, depending on the guard, but, um, because Sweatham doesn't talk about using cuts all that much. So when we're talking about, and we're also not really doing a whole lot of um, using sword on sword constraint. So having that extra, um, that extra point control coming from having uh, my, my, uh, my fingers, maybe two fingers forward of the, uh, of the, of the cross guard can give me just a little bit. It's really in keeping with what he talks about. But once again, that's not, that's, that's me interpreting it beyond the text. But those are the three, those three grips that I just described are the ones that he explicitly talks about in the text itself. Um, Hob, do you have anything to add to that? No, um, I mean, he specifies the grips and, and spends an incredible amount of time describing them and then never talks about them again, which makes no sense, but it may just be him being disorganized. I mean, the one clue we have is he calls the one with the pommel the stoccata grip, and uh, he use, and it is really useful for that low stomach thrust that he calls stoccata. Yeah. So, and and for those who don't know, in in real Italian terminology, um, all the way on up from from um, Bolognese on through um, a lot of the Italian sources in the 1600s, a stoccata is a is an upward um, moving thrust and an imbricata is a downward moving thrust. Typically staccatas are thrusts that you give from the, from uh, um, either uh, seconda, terza, or quarta, and an imbricata is a thrust that comes from, from prima. But Ital a lot of times you see this across some Italian, some uh, British teachers where they'll use, they'll kind of um, appropriate <laughs> uh, Italian rapier terminology in weird ways that aren't necessarily in keeping with someone who is familiar with what it actually means across different Italian masters. But imbricata, it's really not that far different than an imbricata is just an upward, is just a thrust going upward rather than downward. Chandler, did that uh, answer your question? Yeah, man, uh, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, anybody else? I apologize if I'm going over the class. You have a question about lefties in chat. Oh, yeah. Um, so do you want to have a question? Or do you want to have a conversation about lefties? Hop? No, I'm saying oh, oh, like, in the chat. Okay, I use it. How much is it, how much is the is is the matchup for lefties? Does it make too much weirder just reverse the responses? Uh, all right. So I use the lefty. It's not too much different. It's just mostly if you want to execute. Okay. So, um, as far as lefties go, so, um, the, the forehand ward is totally the same for lefties. Um, there's also the cross guard, um, which is, which, um, Hob talked about in his video. I don't talk about that much. Um, I haven't used it really all that much to be completely honest. Um, but uh, as far as the true guard against lefties, I would argue it's this, it's similar um, because once again, I'm not, um, but you just really need to be that much more diligent about um, using that cross parry where you're sweeping inward um, like, like here. So one of the big, this is where it's really important to have, um, to not have your dagger, uh, really that much further back than your sword because you want to have them together where you can just really quickly interchange the two and coordinate the motion of the two. Um, so having that just, you just, this is, I'll be honest, this and this are the simplest things in the world. Easiest thing in the world to do. It's that kind of, press parry to this side that is harder to execute that being said it's a good system against someone who is a who is a, a of the same of the opposite handedness of you because if i if i'm out here they're all they're going to be poking at my 
and my forearm all day. But if I have my sword back here, they, they really have a lot of steel um, here to have to get through. Uh, so, but, but like I said, I just need to be that much more diligent in really get, not getting my sword and my dagger tangled up um, in doing that cross and doing that cross response and not getting greedy with trying for those uh, for that second intention uh, attack, which they might be relying on uh, for me to overcommit to that side. Really, just doing that quick, you know, parry counterattack, get out. Parry counterattack, get out, and then and then uh, stab at them from the outside. Any more questions? Uh, you know, it may be just a personal thing with uh, mm -hmm. my own footwork, but something I've noticed, and it doesn't happen every time, but uh, sometimes with the footwork, how they're more, um, I guess, in line, how like yes. uh, your lead foot is kind of in the, yeah, the, the heel of your lead foot is kind of in line with the, I guess, like the pocket of the inside of your rear foot. Yeah. Um, every now and again, especially if I need to quickly retreat, out of an attack, um, I end up kind of stumbling over my feet. Is that just a personal thing where I need to make a habit of moving my back foot more than my front foot if I'm moving backwards? Or does he have stuff about like lateral steps around? So retreats, retreats are, the, are the main example of where Swetnam does a lot, is where Swetnam does say that you can cross your feet. He, uh, he calls them slips. Um, okay. So um, although it's good to remain diligent with having, with not crossing your feet when doing offensive movement, um, uh, crossing your feet, uh, if you need to, when doing, when doing a retreat, a retreating motion, um, is fine. Uh, he just, um, that's just don't get married to it in the, in the retreat. Um, Hob talks about that a little bit in his class, uh, or Hop talked about that a little bit in his class where he said, you know, that's, that slipping is a part. I'm not as familiar with slipping probably as he is, but, um, but definitely uh, if you need to create a little bit more um, like rather than having them stacked, like right in front of each other, like, like this, uh, if you need to do like more like this, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. Yeah. Cause it, I, I wasn't sure if it was just a personal thing with me. Cause I remember it was something we talked about personally back in your Kaiden days about how your rear foot is one of the main things that determines measure. And I've noticed that if I need to quickly retreat out of something, just moving my front foot and moving just kind of like my torso and head out of the way prevents me from getting stabbed without really giving up where I can attack from. So one thing that's important about, about what you just said about the, uh, about like, as far as like, when you're getting your head out of the way is that Swetnam really makes, really hammers it home to keep that dagger, um, that dagger arm extended. And that's, and that definitely true in both of the guards that I talked about. He says, mm -hmm. one of the worst things you can do is pluck your arm back um, when you're, when you're attacking. So that dagger arm, like I said, it's in front of your, it's in front of your face. It's between your face and your opponent. So if I do this back here, that opens up my face. You know, I'm keeping, okay. I'm keeping my dagger arm extended that whole time. And that's, and I'm getting my face behind that. And this, I would definitely say being disciplined about ex keeping that dagger arm extended is a big part of it. Okay, cool. I'll keep that in mind. So don't be afraid to slip your feet back. Don't be afraid to pass your feet back and keep that dagger arm extended. Um, I would say those are probably the two biggest mistakes people make in uh, in retreating in a sweatum system. Um, Hob, you have anything for that? No, you want that dagger fully extended. You want to be engaging them as far out as possible and slips are sort of there if you have to, but they're not supposed to be part of the plan. Okay. It's just keep, it's something to keep in my back pocket in case. But never get greedy about that measure. You know, you're okay. keep, keeping, keeping your measure, he, he definitely, and that's one thing that a lot of people um, uh, probably don't talk about as much, is that he, he does say in a lot of places, stay at your best distance and don't get close. Like, 
really if if you might be making too greedy of lunges to have to put you in that in that kind of scrambling retreat in the first place. And then um, on the keeping at your best measure, something that I've noticed because I like having um, a lot more measure because I'm tall and lanky and with a long sword, I can use that to my advantage. Uh, a lot of times people I am uh, fighting against will keep trying to, I guess, kind of creep into a closer measure. Uh, is there something he says about how to do that or is it just kind of keep everything extended to try to dissuade them? Don't, yeah, I would say, um, I can't think of anything about um, preventing your opponent from keeping getting into a closer measure other than than just than just backing up as much as you need to. Um, and remember in the SCA, and this is kind of gamesy, but mm -hmm. if you need to burn the rope, burn the rope. <laughs> uh, you 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 you've got it's it's not it's not a it's not a one strike. I'll probably catch yeah. it. Anyone else? Good question so far. All right. Um, so the there are other stuff. One thing that I will say. So as far as resources go, like I said, uh, Hobbs website sweatem.org is fucking fantastic. Um, it pl puts into plain English a, a lot of stuff he talks about. Um, uh, the so. Uh, um, Stephen Hans' uh, manual talks about all the different fencing masters of that period, including Saviolo, Degrassi, and uh, Silver, and Swetnam. Um, buyer beware, he talks about Swetnam's single rapier, and that's basically it. Um, it's, he doesn't really talk about Swetnam's rapier and dagger. Maybe that's just because he you know, plays to his strengths. That's cool. Um, the actual manual itself, you can find parts of it uh, transcribed online. I haven't found a place where it's all transcribed online. Um, this version, which was awesome when I got it, is relatively expensive in the places where I've uh, where I found it. This is the um, early English books online. Uh, like, it's basically a photocopy of it. Um, it's great, but it's also hideously expensive in a lot of places. Um, I would definitely recommend looking at like kind of the usual suspects of used book sites. Uh, to try to find it if you really want to. It's it's easy to read as long as you have just a general idea of, hey, the Fs can be Fs or Ss, and uh, and there's going to be some colorful language at different points. But um, it's it's one of the easiest and most amusing manuals to read. I like it a lot. All right, so thank you for all your time. I am 26 minutes over what I scheduled it as. Uh, uh, I hope you all aren't foregoing another class to uh, to be on my random chat. But if you are, then you know I'm flattered. So, thank you. This has been great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Julian. Yeah, thank you. In a wonderful class. <laughs> thank you, Julian. All right. Thanks. All right, bye.